Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Matza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Cosa Music, inviting you to listen in on conversations with friends, artists, professionals, and experts in our music world. Today, I have the, the great pleasure of having with me Mr. Frank Epstein, who is a, who is a wonderful percussionist. We've had him uh, at Cosa, at the camps, and... We'll have the, we'll have the story, but before we get we get into the shaping your journey, Frank, thank you so much for for being on the show and, and joining me on this, and and um, I wanted to ask you first thing, what was that spark? What was the thing that got you going in in the very beginning? Music. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would I would have to say. Um, couple of things. Uh, the first thing might might have been when my mother sent me to a music summer music camp. Okay. At the time I was uh, if I if I was a player, it was the piano. But I went there as a percussionist. And I went there as a percussionist because when I went to junior high school, that's really where it started, and the and the and I signed up for orchestra, and the uh, the conductor of the orchestra, who was an oboist actually, his name is Frank Desby. Uh, he was kind of a character, but as it turns out, I I signed up for the orchestra to to play piano. Okay, because I was a pianist, so called, and uh, and and there were five of us that had auditioned uh, that were there to. Join the orchestra as a percut as, as a pianist, and he says, "Look, I I only need one pianist, uh, maybe two. Why don't three of you just go to the other side of the orchestra and play percussion?" Uh, well, I didn't know what that was or anything, but I went over there and just wanted to be a member of the group, and it was a class, of course, you know. And uh, so, and then he says, "Here, this is a pair of drumsticks. Put them in your hands." And go home, and and play and practice a single stroke roll, roll on the floor. And so I went home and I went, <laughs> banged it, banged the floor every day. And then he taught me the uh, mama daddy roll, right? I went home and practiced that. Well, and then uh, there was a drummer and a real drummer amongst us. Play drum set and snare drum on this and that, and you know you pick up things. You hit a woodblock, you bang a tambourine, triangle, cymbal, whatever, and so that went on real good. And by the by the time I graduated from junior high school, and the and there was this uh, graduation ceremony and a and a concert and all that. And I think, as I recall, I ended up playing the timpani, so I had somehow managed to. Bridge, bridge all the little instruments and got to the timpani. And so uh, then I went to high school. And um, at that point, I was sent to this summer music camp, which is still around. It's called Idlewild. It's in, Cal in California, Southern California. And at, the at that time, Idlewild was owned and run by University of Southern California. And so... Um, it was there that I uh, met my former teacher. There, there was a guy there. His name is Robert Sonner, who I still keep in contact with today. Nice. Certainly, uh, gee, 60 plus years later. And um, I still revere him as my first and perhaps last teacher because he taught me many things besides music and drumming. Um, uh, so at the end of the camp, he he wrote this beautiful note uh, as a review saying, you know, I see some talent in Frank and he ought to continue, blah, blah, blah. Next thing I know, I was studying with Bob Sonner on a weekly basis. And things were going really good all through high school. Um, uh, uh, you know, I improved. And, um, and then... Uh, Graduated from high school, 
and I was sent, I, I applied and got into what they call Los Angeles City College. It's a two-year school. And, and in the middle of the first year, we had a call from Bob Sonner saying, hey, I have a spot for you at University of Southern California. Why don't you switch schools and come over to the, to the university? And of course, it had to come with some scholarship because we had no, no funds for that. And he pulled it all together and he got me over there. And I stayed for the next uh, four and a, I stayed for five years at USC. I was a double major, percussion, performance, and uh, music education, both. And I, f I fulfilled all the uh, the requirements for music ed. I did student teaching for a whole year. I uh, I played in the marching band, and I, I performed at uh, at the um, Rose Bowl twice. Nice. And, it, and then the Rose Bowl parade, and all of that kind of stuff. And it was all kind of cool, you know. And I, I remember fondly that if USC did not go to the Rose Bowl because USC and UCLA were, you know, were competitors. And sometimes USC went and sometimes UCLA went. But the good thing about USC losing and not going to the Rose Bowl is we were invited to perform at uh, Disneyland. And I was in that first year that they had a, a parade down Main Street of Disneyland while you were wearing these fiberglass uniforms of of a marching um, a band musician, okay? Okay. And it included a full thing out of fiberglass, covered your entire chest, your waist, and down to your legs with these joints in it that would that could bend like this, you know. You ended up like a mechanical man, and the headpiece on it was a huge round face with a tremendous long nose, a little two little holes for your eyes. You could hardly see anything but straight ahead. You you'd have to turn your whole body to, to look, you know, to the sides and all. Right. And, and uh, a huge nose, and then attached to the round head was like a two foot high black hat, all one unit, heavy, uncomfortable, painful, really. <laughs> And then I had a big drum and hung on to me. And we marched down Main Street. And one day, we did this every day for two weeks. We marched four times a day. Wow. And we made good money. And one day, I did look to the side, and I see no one. I see Dwight Eisenhower sitting right there. I just I just walked right past Dwight Eisenhower. I was really, you know, thrilled with that. Anyway, that was cool, and uh, that was uh, that was uh, university, and uh, eventually I graduated there. And uh, during my time, during those five years, having had a rather late start in the music per uh, percussion performance uh, media, um, I ended up at um, taking lessons for four or five different teachers at the same time. And so uh, there was Bob Sonner, there was, uh, there was uh, Charlie White, the then timpanist of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, already an old time timer when I got to him. And uh, a guy named John DeSoto uh, taught me a drum set. And um, Earl Hatch, rather well-known name, Yes, uh, yes. marimba and mallet specialist and then murray spivak mm. a very fine musician um, and an unusually uh, capable teacher for snare drum uh, murray spivak there is a, a website now you go to murray spivak and all of his former students are talking about murray he, he was a unique figure uh, he was a sound engineer in the movie industry. I don't know if you know that. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. And he he did the sound for My Fair Lady. And one of the things he did there, he he took a set of glockenspiel and put little little uh, springs under each note to create a, a vibrato. Bang, 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 like that. Wow. It was very cool, Beautiful. very successful. 
he was a kind of a genius, okay, and he was appreciated by uh, everyone in the industry in in uh, in Los Angeles at that time. So I was lucky to have a year or two with him. I wish I had more, actually. Uh, but uh, in my senior year at the university, um, I was having a lesson with Bill Kraft at that point, and um, the phone rang. And and he says, excuse me, Frank, I'll, I'll just answer that call. And uh, he says, gets on the phone. He says, oh, really? Oh, oh, well, oh, well, let me ask. And so he holds the phone down. He says, Frank, are you interested in going to San Antonio to play in the symphony? I said, yeah, sure, of course, you know. And so he said, uh, he'll be in touch with you later. And and uh, and took the phone number and all that. So that was the lesson. And sure enough, uh, that might have been in the that might have been in the spring of nineteen sixty five. Yeah, and um, that uh, summer I was playing extra with the LA Philharmonic already for quite some time, actually, and uh, and. Uh, I played a concert at the Hollywood Bowl with Igor Stravinsky conducting. I mean, nice, pretty good nice. stuff, you know. And uh, on that one concert, I had my car loaded up uh, with my clothing, my instruments, my music, this and that. And after the concert, I drove off to go to San Antonio. And it was a long, you know, it's a long drive. It's about 15, 16, 17 hour drive. And uh, I think I got... Uh, I got to halfway to, uh, uh, I forget the town, it's on the Mexican border, Laredo, <laughs> Texas, maybe. Anyway, I found myself down to San Antonio, and I had arranged for to take the house that a former friend of mine who had been playing there and whose spot I took, okay? I met this guy at Tanglewood, 1961, and... Uh, uh, he had a house there, and I, he says, do you want to take over the house? I said, yes, and it was a three-bedroom house with a huge backyard, and I was a kid. I can't remember how old it was. I got to have to think that one out, but uh, it, it was quite the thing. Oops. Oh, dear. Hold on a second. Um, uh, well, when when I appeared in town, it turned out that the house was being renovated, painted and whatnot, and I couldn't move in. And so the <laughs> owner says, "Do you want to move? Do you want to move into my uh, my garage? It's, it's got a bed in it." And um, I said, "Well, okay." So I the garage was full of junk, you know, paint cans and ladders and tools and whatever. In the middle of the room was a bed. And it, what I didn't know at the time, it was there was a, a uh, uh, there was a uh, pandemic there in San Antonio of these uh, I forgot um, I forget what you call them these little animals that fly in the air and they uh, billions of them um, fly into your city in this case San Antonio and they pile up like ten twelve feet high against buildings. Wow. Acacia, Acacia or something like that they're called. And, of course, they were all over that damn garage. Excuse my language. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd crawl on your face and your nose. And they could, well, I didn't sleep at all for a whole week. And wow. I had to, you know, stay there for the time. Anyway, that's, what, that's how I think about my first uh, adventure outside of uh, my home. And on my first job, uh, the, the job itself was kind of nice. Um, uh, I met the timpanist. His name was Harvey Biskin, who passed away just a few years ago. A wonderful guy, a wonderful family. They took me in like I was one of their own and uh, invited me to dinner uh, every uh, Friday night and stuff like this. And it was, it was really nice. And uh, I had two great years there. And uh, I attended. I, I decided to go to school as well, and I attended three universities in San Antonio, including uh, a Catholic school run by by nuns. And I was the only boy 
was the only boy in the entire school. Wow. In the class I took. <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> it was all women. <laughs> wow. But I went to other schools too. Can't remember their name. Uh, well, the Catholic school was St. Mary's. And then I went to Trinity College, which was a pretty darn good school. Yes. I took all the subjects I couldn't take while I was doing my music studies at USC. So I took Shakespeare and history, this uh, romantic literature, this and that, whatever. It was all good stuff. And uh, unfortunately, I got sick as a dog from running around, running around during the day at class. And it, it was a nighttime rehearsing orchestra at that point. And um, the, yeah, it kind of wore me down. I ended up in the hospital. Well, uh, I, I was in the hospital for a week or two and came home. And there was a notice from the from the from the military that I was about to be drafted, and I said, "Oh my God!" And uh, so I went for my physical, but because I had, you know, I was sick, my blood count was totally messed up, and they gave me a four F, <laughs> and uh, I was turned down. And they said, "You got to come back in six months and uh, get retested." I said, "Okay." So I quit the orchestra and I went to, I decided to enroll at the New England Conservatory and study with Vic Firth, okay? Ah, yes. Who I had met at Tanglewood while I had been a student already for a couple of years. And uh, if you were a full-time student, you you would not immediately be drafted. That was the the rumor. And so, yeah, so I, after two years, I left San Antonio and came to uh, Boston enrolled at the University of Southern California. And uh, um, as it turned out in that first year, my, my future predecessor in the orchestra, a guy named Tommy Thompson, who had been known as one of the great symbolists at a time when there, that was, there were very few symbolists. You know, there were percussionists, there were timpanists, but a specialist on symbols is quite rare. It's only a yeah. couple of them. And so um, uh, he un had an unfortunate accident, was killed. And then there was an opening. And, and so I, I went for it. I auditioned for it. And I got in. Okay. And this was like in May of 67, I believe. Yeah. And um, I got in and uh, decided I would like to finish up school and get my master's degree. So uh, I stayed in school that year and the next year. And, uh, um, you know, had a great time. It was a very exciting period in my life. And, uh, uh, you know, had to learn the repertoire, had to learn how to play cymbals, <laughs> which I, I always had a knack for cymbals for some reason, actually. Uh, but um, now it was for real. And I, I, I um, uh, the, at, even at that time in 67, 68, Every uh, concert was recorded, but it was not like today. You just go and get a CD of it. I had to request a tape. It was reel-to-reel -reel tapes and all that kind of stuff. And um, I, I, t I got every piece of every every concert. I get a tape of it, and I'd study it religiously and listen to what I was doing, how it fit, how it was, uh, you know, it's... Sounded too long, too short, to this, to that, too high, too low, and I and I created my own kind of uh, way of playing, so that um, first of all I inherited all of my predecessor symbols, and uh, I found hundreds and hundreds of symbols at Symphony Hall in Boston, and all of a sudden they were like all mine, so to speak, right, and right. Uh, including the active symbols he was using. Piles and piles of symbols that he had used. And then way up in the attic of Symphony Hall, there was this suitcase full of symbols. And that why they were there or what they were for or whatever, I don't know. He had, I think he had maybe a 20-year career or something like that. And so, uh, yeah, I must have had, I don't know, two, three hundred symbols there for me. Wow. Anyway, I quickly determined which ones were, you know, really good, which which were the active pairs that he was using at the very end. I put them all up in here, and I, I could uh, listen to past recordings of the BSO 
I could figure out what symbols he was using just by the way they sounded. And I kind of educated myself into his sound, the sounds he was creating, and um, made them mine. But more importantly, I was looking at, uh, at the length of notes, because Symphony Hall, the acoustics are incredible. And, and uh, first of all, you can drop, you can drop uh, a pin, okay, and you can hear it in the back hall, the back of the hall. There's no doubt about it. And uh, the other thing that I noticed is that if you drop something, and I had my occasions, <laughs> uh, it sounds yes. good. <laughs> you cannot make an ugly sound in Symphony Hall. I mean, that's a very, very interesting cool observation. Interesting. So the orchestra always sounded fabulous, okay, just because of the hall itself, never mind the orchestra itself. Um, anyway, um, I educated myself for the basic repertoire. It took about five years. And uh, all of the French repertoire that the orchestra is famous for under Charles Munch is the conductor. I never played with Charles Munch, actually. Uh, but I did see him conduct as a student at Tanglewood. And one time, um, the orchestra came to Los Angeles. This is just a short story, OK? I, I, um, and Munch was conducting. He was doing the. He was doing some Bach, and he had a way of showing all the sixteenth notes that went by, you know, from his beat. And it was just fabulous. Anyway, since I had been a student at Tanglewood, and after the concert, uh, as we're leaving, who was walking right in front of us is Charles Munch, and he goes up to the corner, and he stands there. And so I went up to him. I said, to him, Mr. Munch, I'm Frank, I don't know, was at Tanglewood. Do you need a ride? Can we give you a ride home? He says, yes, thank you. And so uh, I ran up and got the car from where, where it was parked. I picked, we picked him up. My mother and my brother were there. And I quickly tuned the radio to the classic station because I had some junk on, <laughs> you know. And, and uh, he gets in the car and I, the radio pops up. He says, Arrête la radio, si vous play." How's my French? <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> that, huh? yeah, that was so I turned the radio off. We took him to the hotel. That was the end of the story. But anyway, it was fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, so now back to... Uh, the symbols. I mean, me. I, w I wanted to just interject. I mean, it's really interesting what you're saying about the, the symbols and the length, the... the uh, the whole decay, the whole attack. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I studied with Pierre Belleuse in, in Montreal at McGill, who was yeah. in the Montreal Symphony, and he was the cymbal player of the orchestra. Mm. And so he uh, taught me a lot, and anybody who studied with him, he was uh, very meticulous about sound, about the nuance, about tone, about... He was incredible. So I mm. learned quite a bit, and I've become a a kind of a maniac in that regard. I can't, you know, when I'm playing drums and I'm, you know, e even in recordings or anything, when I hear a cymbal that, that shouldn't be there and it, the, the chord changes, but the note of the cymbal is, I, I don't have perfect pitch, but mm -hmm. I've developed that, that sensitivity to what you're talking about, what you're famous for actually, mm -hmm. is to know when that decay or when that cymbal should not be present. And it would drive me crazy for years. Yeah. And it was just because of, of that kind of training. So I, I really appreciate what, what you've mm. done. And, you know, of course, you have the yeah. book. Yeah. yeah no, let... But it, uh, it's a very good point you make. And, in fact, I was probably first concerned about uh, the symbols sounding beyond a, a generic cutoff. And you have that symbol sound in the air. Because once you make the sound, it, it travels, it goes and once it's away from you, you can't stop it. It's a ringing instrument. And so I had to learn how to play, how to cut them off slightly ahead so that that sound would, would not be there when the orchestra's sound is gone. Right. Yeah. And so I applied that. I went a little further, and I would apply that to certain quarter notes or eighth notes or sixteenths or thirty-second notes. I created ways of playing short notes that were what I call very active notes. So you get pure cymbal sound, tone, sound. And then uh, if there was a rest after that note, 
I did everything I could to observe that rest. Right. And, and because the cymbals are a ringing instrument, it's not really natural in one sense to cut them off. But that's what I did. And I call that, you know, rhythmic 2D play. If I want to play the same rhythm as the brass, mostly I I went to the brass for that. Because they're when they make a sound and they stop blowing, the sound is still still right out in the air there. It's still being it's still being heard. Sorry for the the communications here. Uh I'll let that go because that'll be for my wife. Um uh, sorry. No, but you, I mean, it's really interesting what you're saying there, Frank, because uh, many people don't um, don't pay attention to that. I'll, I mean, they'll play, they have great cymbals and they'll have, yeah. um, you know, they'll play well, but sometimes the pitch or where you play it on the cymbal, how yeah. long, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's so important. It's so I important. made a big deal in time. I developed all these ideas, but pitch, you mentioned pitch. And I would definitely, if playing with woodwinds, choose a higher pair, and playing with brass, a larger pair, darker in color, or, you know, dark and light, medium and high, especially on suspended cymbals, uh, of which every one of them sounds different. Yep. And depending how fussy you want to be, uh, you know, I always carried like four suspended cymbals. And I always had two, at least two out, even though I might have one note. No, I would no for one note. I wouldn't have two cymbals to suspend the cymbals out. But for, there were two notes. It's very possible I would play one note on this cymbal and the other note on that cymbal, and the difference being a pitch. And also, uh, typically, the slightly smaller cymbal would be much faster. I could control the length of the note that way, and. Uh, uh, so pitch became a, a a close second to the length of the notes. Then I got into it. And this goes, uh, Frank. This, I mean, you're talking about orchestral, but I mean, I've yeah. I've played a lot of orchestral too and, and classical. Yeah. But in 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 as a drum set player in whatever music you're playing, to me, it's the same <laughs> principles. And just recently, I was driving in my car, and and there's this new record. I won't say that it's a very famous group that has a new record out. And I'm listening to it, and and I had to turn the radio off because it was a great song, great band. I, I really like what they do. But the drummer would be playing, and the drummer is a great drummer, be playing these crash cymbals on these punches. The the chords are different, but the the, the cymbal is the same, the same yeah. cymbol that, that, that I hate he that. or she's. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't listen. <laughs> Because yeah. it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> so Absolutely. you are, yeah. you are the man on that one. Mm. All right. So anyway, I, I thought after about five years that I, some of that music came back, you know, and I would scribble things, ideas into the parts and uh, copy the parts. And so I always kind of was prepared. Uh, and, and what did happen, which was interesting, that's, I would mark my part to play this symbol in a you know long or short or high or low, whatever. And then you get a different conductor and then you said and he, you know, you have one that comes in beating the the blazes out of the score, and then you have a boulez because he plays like this, you know? And so I have to change the whole style of playing for him because all of a sudden you're listening, you're hearing different kind of music. Um from the same piece from a different conductor and so you have to be quick on the trigger and and uh, change your style your whole style so i started marking my part i would do this for bulez i would do this for ozawa i would do this use this symbol for the you know what i mean for the same note i would have two or three wow. options uh for critical moments in a piece and you kept yeah. those notes yeah yeah pretty much yeah beautiful and, a lot of what I'm describing here is in my book. Yes, which, which is called symbol the, symbolism, right? Symbolisms with an S. With an S. Symbolism. Because if you look up the word symbolism, you might not find it because of that one S. But um, um, yeah, the the book came out 
you know, when I was, I would say, a mature player, and I knew what I was doing, and um, uh, it was a lot of fun. It took took I think it took me fourteen years to to get that book done, and uh, it does have a uh, hundred excerpts in there that are that on two CDs included in the book um, um, will demonstrate just about everything of those hundred uh, yeah. excerpts. No, it's a great book. And when you were, at, I mean, you've come to, to close of the camps. Uh, I remember you doing this wonderful master class where you uh, demonstrated a lot of these, yeah. well, a lot of, I mean, the, yeah. in the time that you had. And people would come up to me and say, I had no idea. And yeah. I said, well, that's only the beginning, <laughs> of yeah. course. The book that has a chapter in it uh, where the word symbolisms um, that comes into play. It's entitled yeah. Symbolisms, and it's special strokes, uh, special ways to play a symbol, a lot of slides and and different methods to create special sounds that um, I wish the composers had been around to hear to see how they, how the, what the results is if you change the way you play the symbol, uh, the technique involved for short notes and shorter notes and the shortest note. And all of that kind of stuff is is in there. So there's 20, I believe there's 22 symbolisms. And uh, uh, two of them were actually created by the composers themselves. Um, at the book, you'll find out what I'm talking yeah, about. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I have the book. and, and I, Oh, I, okay, good. Oh, yes. No, no, no I have the book, uh, Frank. But the other, the, other, the other thing I was going to say is, I mean, before, just to interrupt for a second, also, I mean, one has to keep in mind the venue you're playing in, the hall, which will change something about what you do. As, right? I, as we toured, I would have a whole second set of symbols available because some of the hall, many of the halls were not, did not have the same quality acoustics at symphony hall and i would have to change the symbols to be a little heavier to have a little more punch if the hall is less live which is often the case often the case yeah and and typically when we tour it's always the big blockbuster pieces that you take whether it's a Mahler, the Mahler symphony some tchaikovsky whatever and yeah i had to carry two different sets of symbols and suspend the symbols for that yeah um, when I uh, joined the orchestra, I was hired by the conservatory as a teacher, as a young, young youngster, and I was teaching with uh, Vic Firth, being the master there. And uh, uh, it, was, it was pretty nice. And uh, uh, early on, I formed uh, what became one of my uh, uh, loves, let's say. I formed a, a percussion ensemble. At the time, at that time, Gunther Schuller was the president, and I remember right. walking in, uh, and I suggested to Gunther that NEC needed a, a full-time percussion ensemble, and would he uh, approve that? And he says, "Well, he had just been appointed." And he says, "I don't want to be the president of a conservatory that does not have a functioning uh, percussion ensemble." So the answer was yes, <laughs> and we set it up. Uh, so that I could rehearse in the hall, Jordan Hall, and uh, it was a marvelous hall to to play in, much less to to rehearse in. I had the hall every week, and uh, over the years that uh, didn't sit well with some of my famous colleagues, who say, "Well, why does Epstein bring his drums in there? Why can't I rehearse in there?" <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, eventually, I um, I was booted out of the hall, but not before they had built a new hall. And we then moved to the new hall, which was not as convenient and not as you know comfortable because we had a completely new set of instruments in the hall, in the uh, rehearsal hall. And then when we went for the concert and the dress rehearsal, we had we had to get used to the you know different different instruments and they all sounded different so of course. it it uh, it was okay but yeah anyway so i started teaching at school we had the ensemble i, I was asked to teach a class in rhythm and and so i said okay but i really didn't know how to how to go forward 
it had it had it had happened that Gunther Schuller taught a course at Tanglewood on rhythm, a polyrhythm actually, and um, I called Gunther and I says, "Look, they asked me to teach this class. Uh, can you give me some 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 hints?" He says, "Sure, I'll give you all of my notes from the course he taught at Tanglewood Beautiful. about polyrhythm." So I had access to that. And uh, it was a fun class. Maybe, maybe the best part of that class is that one of my students turned out to be my wife. <laughs> oh, in the future, nice. actually, yeah. <laughs> Some years later, Mary took my percussion class, which was no, it was a percussion class, not the rhythm class. Uh, there were two. I taught a percussion music ed kind of a class too. Anyway. Um, that was all good. I taught at at the NEC for, I figure, about fifty four years, uh, before I wow. stepped down, and uh, I had forty three years with the orchestra before I decided to step down. And um, somewhere very early on, because of my experiences at Tanglewood, playing new music as a student and loving it, believe it or not. Uh, I decided to form an ensemble, which uh, was called Collage. And Collage celebrated its 50th anniversary last season. And nice. It's still going. <laughs> Beautiful. And next year, we're planning our 51st season. And at that point, I, I will step down as the, uh, as the uh, I'm president of the board right now. And um, my job is to raise funds and look after the the health of the organization it needs a little more help than I can provide. And so, yeah, it's time for somebody else to give it a, a, uh, a try. And so uh, we're looking at a considerable change with uh, collage new music in a, in a year or two from now. And you have, do you have uh, recordings with uh, collage? Well, we have lots of recordings. Okay. Uh, I gave up being its music, director after 20 years but but at that point we had made 17 recordings lps and since then we've made i don't know half a dozen uh cds and um yeah they're they're out and if you if you were interested and went to the collage music uh, dot org website uh, most of our concerts that are taped videoed are there and access to the recordings are there it's quite a nice site at this point collage new music yeah okay uh, and we'll continue working on it and so we're getting to my retirement uh, moments which was in 2011. funny thing about that uh, is that when one retires from the orchestra, you're brought up front uh, to take a bow from the podium, the conductor's podium. And uh, so I took a bow at uh, Symphony Hall, and the conductor was uh, the conductor was um, Charles. Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, um, who conducted the Montreal Symphony? Oh, Dutois. Uh, Charles Dutois. Okay. was conducting us for that particular concert where the where I was to get my bow. And uh well, I I didn't know Charles except he was a terrific conductor. So yes. I went up to the front and I put out my arm and he takes my arm and yanks me into him and gives me a huge hug <laughs> right there in front of everybody as if he's my best friend, you know, but I really, you know, it, didn't know the guy, but he, it was very nice. And then he pushed me onto the podium, and I took my bow. And then, um, I, then you know, I went back and we finished a concert or whatever. And um, it turns out that the following summer, uh, Charles Dupont conducted the orchestra again. And one doesn't retire typically till after the summer. It's the end of the, the year. And so he looks over and he sees me playing. And while he's conducting, he goes like, <laughs> what are you doing there? And so again, at intermission, he walked over 
And he said, well, what's going on? I said, well, I, I don't retire till you know, after Tanglewood. Oh, he said, great. Okay. And so that was cool. And then I did retire, um, actually. Um, um, but I stayed on for one week into the next season because they were going to do the symphony. The, uh, they were going to do the uh, barely o requiem, you know, yeah. with ten eleven percussion. And I said, you know, I really like playing that. So, can I retire after the first week? And they said, yeah, sure. And so I stayed for the week. And by the time after Tang, where there's a month vacation, by the time they started the season, they changed the program to Mozart. So I didn't play at all. <laughs> like I paid for that one week. <laughs> nice, nice. And, uh, but what I had done is I had scheduled myself about 30 master classes throughout the country at that point. Right. And uh, one of my first stops was Philadelphia. I went to Phil I went to hear the orchestra. And uh, the guys there say, well, come on in, sit back here and and uh, you know, enjoy. And we'll we'll talk later. And so um I'm in intermission, I quickly tell him about the story, the bear hug he gave me, and then the thing at Tanglewood and all that. They said, well, well, why don't you come up and say hi, you know? And so I did. And I went up, and he was standing on the podium. It was intermission or whatever. <clears throat> and he, uh, I greeted him, and he greeted me, and it was it was nice, very nice. He was, he was a nice man at that point. And so uh, then uh, the guy said, well, look, why don't you come on stage? When we start the, after intermission, they're doing Strauss, Bourgeois, Gentilhomme, beautiful piece. I said, love that, love that. And so uh, I think put me down behind a string somewhere. And he starts to rehearse, and he's rehearsing. And he sees me back there sitting, and he goes <laughs> and stops the orchestra. He says, go. And I'm like, I turn red as a beat because I'm, what do you mean, go? He says, go. He says, all of you go. He excused the entire percussion section to leave the rehearsal so, so we could have a chat or a cup of coffee, whatever. Can you imagine? And wow. so um, as we're walking out and the, the entire section comes with me, they say, they say, Frank, you got clout. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that's the story. Nice. I mean, Dutois, I mean, when he was in Montreal, I mean, he did a, a lot of great things. I mean, the orchestra used to uh, record and won, won uh, so many awards for, for the recordings oh, yeah. that they did. Yeah. Oh, yes. The recordings are great. Yes. Um, amazing. Uh, there, was a, there are a couple that I, I listen to every once in a while. The the I mean he he managed to uh, I mean he 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 was really tough with the orchestra as far as yeah. like bringing a lot out of them. Yeah. Uh, it must have killed a few of them, but the sound yeah. at the end was like amazing. And yeah. and I mean I I got to work with him a few times, but the one one time it was funny because I was doing a lot of freelance work in 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 everything. I was touring with repercussion. I was freelancing a little bit, subbing for my teacher in orchestras here and there a little bit. Uh, but that was not what I, what I really wanted to do. At the same time, I was doing a, a, a national television show, and we are 19 musicians, horn, strings. Uh, it was a, a live show, you know, a variety show, and we would have artists that they would invite. And one day they invited Charles Dutois to, to conduct the orchestra, but in a pop situation, right? Mm. And so that was really interesting because he came in and um, uh, he, he looks at me, he said, uh, as we were going out, because this was live, live on the air, I, he's right behind me and he looked and he whispers in my ear, he says, I'm following you. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing drum set in this, yeah. In, yeah. in this situation. So it was really funny. He's there and he's looking at me. And I, I'm I'm playing, and he's following me. You could clearly tell, you know, he's <laughs> it was just a guest guest conducting, but he had, he has a, he had a good good sense of humor in that regard. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me uh, try to wind this wind this conversation up. Yes, yes. After Inter I retired, very interesting, by the way. After I retired, uh, I I kept on teaching for uh, quite a while, and. Um, 
I had uh, collage, new music that I was, you know, uh, working on. A lot of time I put into collage. And um, I also developed my my little business that I have had for over 50 years, which is uh, orchestral castanets. Castanets, okay. yes. Huh? Yes, I have a set of those, by the way. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, yes. Um, anyway, Beautiful. Um, I started refining them and pushing, you know, promoting and advertising a little bit. And, um, um, well, I could tell you a few stories, but maybe it gets a little tedious. Uh, but, um, yeah, so I had plenty to do is, is what I was saying. And I kept teaching until uh, COVID happened. Right. No. Yeah, it became, you know, it became very difficult uh, teaching over internet and all that kind of stuff, which I got used to, by the way, after the fact. But uh, um, um, at the time, it seemed, you know, not much fun. And no, in the very beginning, uh, it was tough for everyone. I mean, oh, it was everything. The, the faculty had a tough time, you know, learning the ropes of setting up and uh, zooming like we are now. And uh, yeah, I, I'm among those old enough to find a computer, you know, a difficult animal to, to, to use. And uh, anyway, so I was uh, busy enough. And uh, uh, when COVID started, uh, we decided to move out to our summer home in the Berkshires. Uh, where, where we're in the woods, there's nobody here but us right now, you know, <laughs> and nice. and the, and the wild animals that come by occasionally. And uh, as it turned out, uh, my daughters moved into our Brookline Boston house for different reasons, and uh, well, they're still there, <laughs> and we're still here. And this is three <laughs> years later, so we don't know exactly what's what's happening on that front, but. Uh, they're making good use of the house, and we're making, and we are actually liking our, our summer house. Though living here is a little different. You've got good stoves to to feed during the winter, and uh, you know we're getting used to it, and we're developing a new, new, uh, uh, a new uh, set of friends out here, and uh, we like we like this living out here. Yeah. And that, well, the nice thing too is, I mean, technology that has that quickly developed during the whole COVID time. F fast forward, I mean, it, it really incredibly. Now you could be anywhere on the planet, and it yeah. almost doesn't matter, except for certain things. Of course, the interpersonal yeah. Yeah. part we miss, yeah. but we can I've, be totally functional, right? Yeah, I've done some teaching over the internet and. Uh, you know, I had my doubts, but it actually works pretty darn good. Yeah, you know? no, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I whenever I tour now, every everywhere I go on the planet, my uh, even when I'm in my house in our house in uh, in Calabria, I just teach, continue teaching. My schedule doesn't change. Mm. You just have to adjust the for the hour differences from yeah. wherever my students are. It's just right. fabulous now. Yeah, so that's great. That's great. Yeah. And what so, what are uh, your plans? What are your plans now, moving forward? Now that you're comfortable yeah. in the in the countryside, and well, I don't know. Um, we're doing a little bit more travel, not a lot. And uh, I lost my brother a year ago, and so we've been uh, g going back to L.A. where he lived uh, to stay in touch with the, his family. You know, because that kind of makes it more difficult without. You know the the head of the family there now. Yes, yes. and so uh, we have plans to go back uh, actually uh, in uh, September, and uh, and we were there last March, and uh, you know we also want to do some other travels, but uh, traveling isn't what it used to be either, and no. it's more no. difficult and you know more uh, more exhausting, I would say perhaps. Sure. And um, well, we we like our life here. We've got a humongous garden going, and uh, uh, I keep up uh, my business. And uh, uh, I want to put, I want to see that collage 
goes into this new phase and continues and uh, uh, has a successful other 50 more years. Yes. Nice. And uh, yeah, so that keeps us busy and occupied and trying to stay healthy also is is uh, an issue at this point or a concern, let's say. A concern, you know? right, right. Yeah. yeah. So those are the things we're looking forward to the Tanglewood season. I, I happen to like going to concerts. Uh, especially now, uh, not involved the active music making actually, and uh, catching up to old friends <laughs> is another, and family all over the world that we have. Uh, nice. So yeah, we're plenty plenty busy. Yeah, beautiful. What would be uh, some um, not, not some necessary some tips, but some advice to uh, people uh, who are following their dreams, following, creating their paths yeah. and the trajectory that, that they're simple. going on. What would you say to them at this point? First of all, never say no. Whatever comes down the path, yes, I, you know, but more, more succinctly is to make the right choice. And for me, and, and to be lucky. Oh, and so when I decided to take the job in San Antonio, I didn't know where it was. I, I I envisioned peace of people with uh, with guns on and and Western hats walking around. I had no idea Texas was kind of a wild place in my head, you know. And uh, leaving leaving San Antonio and going back to school turned out to be a terrific decision because I I auditioned for the BSO. I would never have the Boston about Symphony, auditioning, right? yeah. you know, never mind winning, and. Um, and I did win and, and, uh, it, you know, had a solid career for the next 40 plus years. And, um, uh, I consider that, uh, to have been a, a, a good choice at that time and it, making those choices and listening to advice from the right people and taking it, you know, and, and, um, being yeah. able to make that decision. A lot of people have trouble making any decision. Okay. I yeah. know a few people who can't decide what, what I'm going to wear today. And it's a huge issue, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but that's, that's an overstatement, but it's true. And, um, um, yeah, I, I never said no. I was, I was hungry for knowledge. I was hungry for experiences. Uh, I was never too tired. I was always ready to, to go. And I, I loved, happened to love playing I love playing in an orchestra, any orchestra. And uh yeah, after I retired, I I I took a I took a gig, you know, and it was in a church and um uh, yeah, uh I had to load up my car, I had a snare drum and bongos and cymbals and small items and and, and the stands and, and your all these things and then I get to the it was in a church it was a choral choral group then i had to unpack all the stuff and take it inside and, and set it up and then after concert i had to tear it down put it back in the car then put it back in my studio and i said gee you know maybe maybe uh maybe i don't want to do this <laughs> and so i i cut back i, I mean i kind of stopped the so-called freelance scene because it's it's a different it's a different animal Yes, yes. And and uh um well I didn't I didn't do that. A few years after that I was invited to play in an orchestra up in Portland. Portland, Maine, I think it, it is. And uh, they were doing Mahler second. And they said, Would you like to play? I said, Yeah. And so I uh I grabbed put all my symbols, you know, to, I was gonna play symbols. Took all my cymbals, big ones, special large ones I had for certain notes, and I uh, played my heart out. And the people in the orchestra were all freelancers from Boston, so they were. I had seen all these folks because they would come float in and out of BSO, and uh, it was like a homecoming. It was just great, really beautiful. And um, well, I played as vigorously as I could, but after the concert. I couldn't move. <laughs> My arms were like sore, you know, swinging these big cymbals. 
and I hadn't, I wasn't smart. I hadn't like stretched or I hadn't like prepared myself. I just said, yeah, you know, let's do it. And so it turned out to be, uh, well, I tore, I tore my, my shoulder, the ligament here, and I had to go and get uh, physical therapy. <laughs> As soon as I started the physical therapy, I get another call from the orchestra. Would you like to play Mahler 1? I said, yes, I'd love Mahler 1. <laughs> and then so I told the guy, I said, look, this shoulder is hurting. It's, you know, you got to get me better so that in uh, six weeks from then or two months, I can do the Mahler first. And he says, I'll get you ready. And he got me ready. And so I went and I played the Mahler 1. But after the concert, I couldn't move. <laughs> it was the other shoulder. <laughs> And so I realized, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do that anymore. And uh, so I haven't taken any more. I, I quit. <laughs> I retired again. Uh, but anyway. Uh, I mean, you know. there's, you know, Frank, you know, I always say there's, there's no such thing as coincidence. You are, you show up, you do the work and you be there and you be part of the solution and things always work out. And, and of course, as you say, you have to make decisions. If you stay home, nothing happens, of course. You do nothing, yeah. nothing happens. Yeah. But if you do something and you do something that, that, it, that pulls you in some direction, and you can always change that direction. You can always have a variation, yeah. but yeah. there's no such thing as coincidence. I mean, you, yeah. you design, you know, according to the, the fire that's within you, yeah. and, you and it takes you there. It's all in your true. hands, right? It's true. You've got a few fires burning in you, I can tell. I mean, <laughs> everybody knows it too, but, uh, you know, it's great. It's wonderful. I just can't sit on my hands. And, and it's yeah. funny because during COVID, of course, I went crazy in the beginning because uh, that the, when it happened, it was going to be my biggest and busiest year ever. I, I looked mm. at the calendar and I couldn't see two days off all year together. Mm. So I, I said to Yola, and, you know, we better take a, a little break because I'm already tired just looking at my schedule and I want to be in good shape for this because it was our even our, our 25th anniversary, wedding anniversary. Uh, you know, we had so much uh, stuff going on in, in, in China and in Cuba. We had many, many things going on, uh, touring, promoting my book, uh, all kinds of things. But so then to be completely zero so then I had to learn the whole technology going online, went, moved everything completely online. We did COSA online, yeah. even, yeah. you know, with 15, 13 artists. And we did a five-day intensive completely online. And yeah. Then we did one in Cuba, live from Havana, which I hosted from here. But they were all in Havana, so I had to coordinate really? all of that. And then other things like, you know, I had the, all of these inventions. I mean, like you have your, your castanets that you produced. I have like seven or eight, eight inventions that I created. And I said, let me get those out, patent one at a time, and, and get, just get them out the door. So now those are on their, on their way. The first one is, is being launched this year. It's a, a music stand, the Aldo Hang stand that goes on a mallet frame, mallet instrument frame. So when you move your vibraphone, marimba, or xylophone, or any of those instruments, the stand goes with it. Hmm. It just sits on, easy to take on and off, mm -hmm. and you move it around. You can have five or six of them. That It turns and it becomes a, an accessory table or a table that you put your laptop on or, or yeah. a, a, all of these things. And Manhasset is, is producing it. He's manufacturing really? it. Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I can't sit on my hands and I still have other ideas that are, that are going on. I don't know. I don't know how. Yeah. You know. Well, where, where there's a will, there's a way. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And yeah. you're also, I mean, you are, are I'm so, I'm you've been doing this for so many years. I mean, now, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's good. I mean, physically when, I mean, symbols are hard to, Especially the what what it takes to play yeah. some of those pieces, and with that precision that that you are uh, yeah. so famous for, and the sound and and all of that. So at at a point, I mean, you gotta move on to something else, and it just and also leave room for for others to. Mm. to yeah, get I, I would like to put in an ad for Castanets. Anybody's interested? I have other products too, by the way. Ah, uh, okay. but FrankEpstein.com. 
you go there, you'll see the whole the whole thing, frankepstein.com. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. No, no, that that's fantastic. I'm glad I'm glad you said that because it's it's yeah. important to find to be able to find these mm -hmm. uh, these things. You know, I was thinking the other day how how we, how I well I'm actively dispersing some of my my own instruments that I've collected over the years. But in the old days, you went to a drum shop, you picked out each item. You know, you got to hit it, you got to stroke it, you got to play it, and make your decision. I want this. I want this. I want that one. I want you know. And today, with the mail order business. It's a totally new, different uh, yeah. enterprise, and uh, you you got to trust someone now, and and thank God I have a pretty good reputation for you know high quality playing, but also high quality instruments, right? And and uh, that's why I think it it's it's been out there for over fifty years. It's just kind of hard to believe, but it's it's a fact, yeah. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. FrankEpstein.com, right? FrankEpstein.com. Right. Yes, yeah, sure. Beautiful. Okay, well, I want to, I mean, we can go on for, for days about all of these uh, yeah. uh, ideas, but I want to thank you for, for joining me today, uh, Frank, and, you know, having seen you work uh, with us at, at COSA was always a, a pleasure and you know just having people that are that that deep in in their field and their thing that they can give others inspiration material things to think about for a long time so i, I do want to thank you for this my pleasure thank you so much and as as i always say to be continued to be continued thank you